Hello once again, everyone, and welcome back to another live stream. Let me grab a little bit of uh, coffee here. Mm. It's kind of a chilly day, a little bit cloudy outside, but nevertheless, great day to hang around and uh, chat with all of you. Uh, welcome again. Uh, we have 19 on board. I had 20-something just a couple of minutes ago. I don't know what happened. But anyway... Um, we have a bunch of topics to talk about, and I just want to also uh, let you guys know that next Sunday I will be out of the uh, state. I'll be visiting my sister. At the same time, my wife is going to be attending her aunt's uh, funeral, which takes place in a different area in, in uh, Virginia. But I had been planning on going to see my sister long before this uh, death in the family occurred. So she has told me that I need to go see my sister. So I kept the flight and I'm going to go see my sister. I'm going to fly out Friday and I will be back uh, Sunday afternoon, uh, a little bit late, probably around 530 here in Washington, D.C. Um, that will be the 28th. I'll be back. So I will not have time to do a live stream, uh, unfortunately. So anyway, so. I will try to do some videos. I got a couple of others that I have not yet edited. I already shot them, and they'll be on this week. I've been attempting to to <clears throat> make sure that I upload at least two or three a week, and so that will help. Now, the channel is kind of struggling at this point. This month has been dismal, and I'm thinking that I'm going to have to go back to what I I don't want to charge to become, you know, for you guys to become a member. That's ridiculous. I see so many of these people doing that. And I think that's just crazy. And then they have, they'll have like um, special content. Baloney. No, my content is available for everyone for free. But one thing that I beg you guys do, and I think this is probably the issue, um, the ads that they play, at least watch half of it please, before you click on the, uh, you know, skip button, uh, do me that favor. It doesn't cost you anything but a little bit of time. And that will allow then the algorithm to figure out that, oh, people are actually watching the ads on Joe's videos. So please do that. I know there's only a handful of you here. I will address that issue on a video that I will then post globally. Um, but yeah, it's like, I have never seen, I remember when I first started uh, earning revenue through AdSense, which is the company that controls um, the ads for through Google in, and all of that for uh, YouTube and other platforms under Google. Um, I remember, gosh, even way back, I was making at least $10 a day. And today is like just that. It used to be maybe three times that much. And so my dreams of, say, buying a new printer, no, it's not going to happen because I I am dead set on not using household budget for any of this stuff. This has to be self-sufficient. Now, I also have other revenue uh, income from, say, QMH Ultimate, QMH One, from uh, Inkchip.net, but that doesn't come in uh, every couple of months only. So... Um, this channel needs to be self-sustaining. And even when I run uh, printing demonstrations, that takes paper. And paper is not super cheap. It's not five cents a sheet. It's more than that. So anyway, just trying to keep up with the costs of running this. And I've just been perplexed at how badly the uh, daily income has become. I, maybe it's just this month. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I'll keep you guys... You know, I'm not going to hide anything from you all. I'll keep you guys informed as to how the channel is doing and what I may have to do. I used to do a one-on-one -on, -one, uh, on online, just like we're doing here. You would then get a link and you would join, and I would charge you a fee for getting a hands-on training, if you will, uh, solving a problem. And usually I had like 100% uh, results with everybody that I spoke with. And so that brought in some revenue, a little bit of extra revenue. So maybe I will post something like that on YouTube as I no longer have a website 
again, that began, I was paying more than the website was, you know, generating. So, <laughs> and that's usually the case nowadays. Anyway, all right, so let's begin. Let's say howdy to everyone who is here. Enough with the, uh, you know, negative stuff. Let's just say hello to everyone here. And we will begin at the top. And you guys need to guess who was at the top of the list at 8.31 a.m. my time, which is God knows what time in Europe. In Wales, UK, of course, Nigel Waters. He wins the prize yet again. This guy is loyal as can be. Wow. And he's got a Pro 300 with all the trimmings. And I, I remember him, whether it was him or someone else, uh, telling me that they're using um, inks from... From where? From Ink Owl, from the U.S., and they ship to Europe, and it's affordable. Wow, uh, that's that's interesting. Mm. And also the fact that Nigel has been able to handle, without any issues, the refilling process for the the Pro Three Hundred. You have to disable those chips, and then you can't just ignore it. You have to keep you know, set up a, a very strict schedule for topping off all of the cartridges. And hopefully he has two sets that are disabled. And that would be the easiest one, uh, the easiest way to go about this. You just always have, in this case, you don't even have to reset it. It's all disabled. You just basically top off, put it in a um, storage rack or whatever. If you have Rudy's holder, that's even better for you guys here in the U.S., you just load up your cartridges, keep them ready to go, and the minute that, say, for instance, with a Pro 300, you have Chroma Optimizer, and that will be probably the one that's used the quickest. So you know at what point, say, three weeks, a month, you just remove all the cartridges, put the clips on them, put them on a holder. That will have to be topped off later on. Then you load that full set that you had waiting on the aisles, boom, you're back up to full. You know everything is full, even though nothing is being indicated otherwise. But you know they're full, and you can continue printing. And he's got a down pat. He has really figured this out perfectly. So, hey, kudos to you, my friend. Martin Van Gogh is here from Wales, and I forgot to, sorry, I did not do that. So there is my good friend Nigel. There's Martin, Netherlands. Uh, SCP 900 and I got I got some amazing news for you guys that own a P700 I believe it works with the 700 and the 900 you may know already that it exists but I, I will discuss this and show you uh, what is what it is all about yeah used to be that if you were an Epson user you'd be jealous of certain Canon printers no longer the case okay I'll keep you guys in suspense. Anyway, he's got Ilford papers that he uses. He only advanced black and white and QMH lifetime. Awesome. Henry Stoffel, Stoffel from Cool, cool and Sunny Medford, Mass. Epson P800 OEM inks. QMH Ultimate. Awesome. Welcome back, my friend. He's a regular. Harold Goldberg as well. A regular here from Cool and Wet. Richmond is wet down there. Wow. Whoa. I don't want any rain up here at this point. Pro 100 with all the trimmings. Keep it down there, please. Ron K. Hello from New Jersey. Uh, Epson EcoTank 8550 QMH Ultimate. Awesome. Fred Bird, commercial, legal, and aerial photography. Two Nikons. D800s, I'm jealous. And an Epson P700 also. Nice camera. Ni Ellington, Connecticut is where he's from. Photo Nikon 780 uh, from Edmonton, Canada. Canon Pro 1000, several Epson papers. Uh, photo printers, including Ecotank 8550, 15,000. Uh, QMH Ultimate Lifetime and DxO Photo Lab. He got a bunch of stuff. You can see it right there. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Just Me says, uh, hello from Transylvania. Epson L8580, so that's... That's a tank printer that initially came out several years ago. They were only available overseas, or maybe those are the only ones that are still. Do you have an equal to, say, an EcoTank 
type printer or is that is it all L? Pro 1000, i1 Studio, QMH Ultimate, etc. Kevin Berniarski is here. And hello, Jose, somehow my message got deleted. I don't know how. Um, let me see. Nope. Yeah, it must have somehow. It wasn't me. I I, I can't I can't even delete a message. Uh, let me see if I can. Let me see if I could even do this. Nope. Oh, I can, I can, but believe me, I did not delete your message. So please uh, re-enter it. A I H Gordonk, hello from Connecticut, uh, CT, right? Uh, Canon Pro One Hundred, looking for a pigment ink option to make vinyl stickers as well as gray photo inks. I don't photo prints. I don't think that's going to be uh, able to be done on the Pro One Hundred. So you might need. A, if you want to stick with Canon, you'll have to go to the Pro 10 or the Pro 300, which is the new one now. That's again, the chips are not resettable, so you have to disable them if you want to use uh, pigment. If you want to stick with OEM, then by all means, the Pro 300 will more more than serve you extremely well for that type of application. Ramsey's Dick Dyson. Sorry to hear. We'll make sure I click thumbs up. Yeah. Thank you so much, man. Yeah. Actually, this was a very sad thing. My, my, my wife spoke with her aunt three weeks ago. She sounded wonderful. She's 80-something years old right now. She's had um, lung problems due to smoking all her life. So she spoke with her, and she sounded fantastic. And she really, she told me, wow, she sounded fantastic. And I thought, that's wonderful. So, you know, then all of a sudden the daughter who lives with her um, called and said that she has been hospitalized, that one of her lungs collapsed and they couldn't reinflate it, let's just say. And so from that point on, it was just down a downward spiral and uh, totally unexpected out of nowhere. So, again, I feel really, really bad about not being able to go down this weekend. But like I said, for a couple of months, like three months, I had already planned and bought tickets for uh, Florida to visit my sister that I have also haven't seen for, you know, since my mom passed away uh, several years ago. So that's why there will be no live stream. And even if, well, I would have been back Saturday night had I not gone to Florida and would have probably been able to do the live stream next week. Tim Miller, Louisiana, Canon Pro 100, TM300, and two EcoTank 8550s. Lucky guy. Uh, I love those printers, I'm telling you. Red River Paper, QMH, Alt, QMH1, and Capture One. Ace Lee, I believe you're brand new. I have not seen you here before. But welcome, my friend. Glad to have you. A Canon HP or Epson. To get the HP, it's not for photo printing anymore. So you need to either get a Canon or an Epson printer. Um, some of the Canon printers, even though they are not resettable, they do allow you to disable the chips at least. And so that way you can still refill those cartridges. Um, the 200 version has cartridges equal to the Pro 100. The same design. So you have to have them modified. You have to actually disable those chips. It's a pain because they are opaque. You cannot see your actual ink levels. So there is a procedure where you swap those, those um, Pro 200 chips onto the equivalent color Pro 100 cartridges. Remove those chips and put the other one on. And that way you can then see what you're doing when you're refilling those cartridges. It's... it's, it's they make it very difficult. It's not impossible, but you know, if you were not really good at keeping track in the first place, I would not recommend it because you may end up uh, with an empty cartridge accidentally, and that is not good for a Canon printed. So either that or go to Epson, and again, those Epson new printers, none of them are open for refilling, none of them. Uh, you cannot refill the original cartridges anyway on an Epson printer. Uh, it's nearly impossible unless it's a 700 or a p900 
And that requires to, for you to surgically remove this unit here is composed of about three or four parts. And then blindly, blindly unsnap a little rear cap that has a flapper valve. Forget about it. So you have to rely on refillable cartridges and there aren't any uh, with chips that work. So you're stuck. The newer Epson printers, OEM or nothing, unless you live in Europe or overseas. Here in the USA, they are locked. So you cannot, you cannot go third party with them. This is why it's so important to keep your printers in good conditions. Good condition. The ones that you have now that are indeed able to use refillable systems, third party uh, options, keep, uh, keep them in good shape, please, because the future is dismal, okay, as far as Epson goes. Even Canon, Canon may at some point force you to not be able to, say, disable a chip or make a cartridge basically un unrefillable, okay? So that, that may happen. You never know. You never know what's going to happen in the printing world. Um, anyway, so Steve Excel from London, UK, Epson SC P600 Permajet inks and refillable cartridges. See that? He's got a 600. The 600 is actually open. So if you can find a P600, that's basically equivalent to the R2000. It was uh, eight colors, no gray. So it was, what, yellow, orange, believe it or not. Maybe that it have red and then, yeah, the rest. So a very good printer for color, for color printing. And not so good for monochrome, <clears throat> unless you have a very good profile. And you should be able to print using advanced black and white, but... Maybe it's not even available in that driver. I'm not sure. I don't have that driver installed because I don't own that printer. So anyway, let's continue on. Ron K says, I need to upgrade my camera. I'm still using a Canon D 7D. Um, same thing here. I got a, I think my newest camera is a, a prosumer, maybe even lower quality uh, Nikon D. 3300 i had a d90 and a d70 i never really went for the super high-end cameras uh you know i try to you know exploit what i had available i do have a good set of lenses though but other than that yeah my bodies are not really that that high end um i wouldn't even know what to suggest to you uh, at this point because i really haven't kept up paul rubner Colorado Epson P800. All righty. So how are you dealing with the P800? Are you refilling? Are you using um, the chipless firmware? That's available for the P800. It was otherwise locked. So you install the, the chipless firmware. It is a procedure you have to do perfectly, exactly the, the correct way. Otherwise, you will brick your printer. And then what happens is just like the XP15000 at this point, you just always see full amount of ink on all the channels, all the cartridges. So again, it's just up to you to maintain them always topped off. Kevin says, uh, Ecotank 8550 Canon Pro 300 XP 15,000. I think that's what he was trying to say. And he's from Wisconsin, Ellsworth, Wisconsin. Nice. Ace Lee says, wow. Thanks. Yeah. So, yeah, HP left the photo um, realm quite a number of years ago. They still, I don't know whether they still have the super large format roll type printers. Um, Z, it, it was a Z30 something, 3200 and, and other numbers, depending on the capacity. Um, those were the ones that were for photo printing. They had a couple of uh, small tabletop units that were also photo printing. I believe they had a 13 inch capacity printer. Were you dealing with thermal print heads that were not really that 
capable for uh, pigment type ink. So at that point, at that time, way, way long ago. Uh, so yeah, I would go with Canon probably. Government needs to get involved. Well, that's, you know, that's, um, that's here in the U S um, the e-waste will be too much. Yeah. Um, right. They apparently there are some, unlike Europe, which is more open for um, to allow the the consumer to make the decision as to what will be my my consumables for my printer. It's like me telling you I'm you know a card manufacturer and I force you to use my fuel. You cannot use anyone else's fuel because my nozzle is shaped like a star. You know whatever. And other nozzles don't fit. So I have to use your fuel with your nozzles. So, you know, so no, that's not the case. In Europe, they allow you to use, they have different laws. Um, and so what happens, China immediately will create a a refillable type uh, cartridge for it, not too dissimilar to something like this. And, or, or, or this for other styles of printers. These are all refillable. The thing is, it's about the chip. It's about the chips, um, the read-only unique chip code. Every single chip has a unique fingerprint, okay? And you cannot change that. There is no way you can change that. What you can indeed change is the code dictating how full, half full, or empty that chip is, okay? And it can be reset. When you reset, you're basically rewriting a code. That that part of the code is read and write. So you can read it, the printer reads it, and it tells you you have 80% capacity of ink on the chip. That doesn't mean on the cartridge. It's not exact. And so... As you use it, it just drops. It keeps rewriting this code. It is guessing how much ink I just used from that cartridge. Let me drop it down, okay? And I want to declare it empty before you actually run out of ink. That's that's the goal. And so often, because of the margin of error you would require, you end up with ink in your cartridge that's a little bit too much to just throw away, especially these these big ones. So you end up with, say, at least 10 ml of ink still left in the cartridge. Imagine that because of the way that it, it measures or or computes how much ink has been passed through the printhead and also utilized for, say, cleaning cycles and that sort of thing. Okay. What happens is this. In Europe, I can reset that chip or the chip is, say, auto-resettable where you just basically remove the cartridge from the printer after it's declared empty. You re it has to be declared empty. It cannot work otherwise. Any other way, it has to be declared empty. Then you take it out and top it off. And then when you put it back in, you just broke the, the connection to power and that resets it to full. It rewrites that empty code now as a full code. In Europe, it sees the same fingerprint yet it doesn't care wait a minute it was empty just a second ago and now it's full oh but that's fine i know i know you're cheating but that's fine so in the u.s no you cannot it sees the same fingerprint and whoa 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 you just tried to cheat me it was empty and now it's full uh -uh. no i cannot accept that that's how that's how our printers here work. Okay, I like to put it that way to 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 you know that's the way that I like to explain it because exactly that is what's happening. Okay, so it sees the same fingerprint or code, and now the levels are different. It doesn't accept it. That's that's what's happening here. So you have to you're stuck with using OEM only. Period. That's the way it is. Very sad, but true. John Reed from uh, St. Helena, SAO. I wish I knew what that was. 
Sorry. This is a manual, but it says KM. Okay. That must be C home. Sun home. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry, Emmanuel. Uh, Steve XL P600 uses the same ink set as a P800 fitted with matte black, light black. Yes. Yes, it does. It's a, what they call a ultra chrome K3 ink set. Okay. Three blacks, basically. It's calling the grays black. So it'll have one black for matte, one black for glossy, and then two grays. So, all right. So with a P600, you could you could actually buy refillable cartridges and use those, and it is not locked. And so um, you could then buy, say, large cartridges. For example, um, the P800 supposedly had a different matte black. It was a denser Mac Black than the other previous um, models. So still, you could buy larger cartridges that are Ultra Chrome 3, you know, K3, and just extract that ink and use it. I used to do that all the time. Stuff like this. These are empty now. They, they were never used. I bought them extracted the ink and used it on my larger printers so basically those cartridges if i was able to refill them they could then be used in their respective printers because the chips are still brand new they were never used anywhere i dropped a thing of paper here so you could end up buying say some of these larger volume cartridges depending on like their expiration date on ebay quite often you'll get it for like a third of the original price and then you extract all that ink and then load your smaller cartridges with it. it's totally compatible it's the same color palette the same color value so you can intermix them it doesn't really matter and you'll get great results of course oem results at a much lower cost This is what I've been preaching for years. Um, you know, third party, sure. Third party is much cheaper, but trust me, you're never gonna get the output of OEM. That is the the glory about OEM ink. Yeah, it's expensive. Uh, and you're buying that body every single time, that cartridge body that costs money too. And so, yeah, buy the big cartridges, extract the ink. You simply, with a tip, or one of these, you can literally stick one of these into the port. The ports are all pretty much identical. Suck out the right amount of ink and load it into your, from, from one of these big ones and load it into a little one. And you're good to go. Same ink set because you're buying larger volume cartridges that were meant for a very, uh, a, a much larger capacity printer, but it uses the same ink set. So, and you can always get them cheaper on eBay if they're just close to expiration. You got to be careful. You cannot just buy something that's beyond, you know, 10 years or something like that. No. Emmanuel says, uh, Sun's Home EcoTank 8550 Quiet. Oh, okay. So, shh. Ramses Dyson says, Fuji XH2. XH1 and a Canon Pro 1000 Canon paper using Affinity and QImage software. So you're editing with Affinity and printing with QImage. Can beat that. That's fine. Emmanuel says, sorry, I cannot type on a pass, but I will watch the chat. Okay. All right. Pad. <laughs> he meant, yeah. He's like me. I can't. Yeah. Typing is just horrible. Uh, on my phone. Oh, how often I click send and then I go, oh no. And I read what I just sent to someone. 
all these errors and all these autocorrect. Um, yeah, no. Ron K says, I am thinking about switching to mirrorless now that the technology has been much improved. Yeah, I, again, I, I am way behind you, my friend. I am still dealing with, you know, cameras that are at least eight years old. And I just, yeah. And some of my cameras in my collection go back to the 1950, 19, even 1949, I have one. Uh, and even before that, I have one from 1895 that uses glass plates. <laughs> yeah. I, I cannot dig that. I, I, I sort of like the look. John reads South Atlantic Ocean. But where? Australia? No, that's a wrong ocean, idiot. South Atlantic. What is down in the South Atlantic Ocean? I got to look at a map. Anyway, all right. So let's 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 start. So talking about chips, and this is an ongoing. I mean, ongoing subject. Saint Helena. Oh my gosh. Okay, I need to learn my go back and study my geography. Wow, is that is that where you are at? Wow, amazing. Welcome. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I'm just a lot as a lot at a loss for words right now. Wow, I'll have to tell that to my wife. She'll be surprised. Anyway, so Pro One Thousand. So these puppies right here. We are so lucky, even though the chip is not resettable. Hang on. I I I gotta. So is that miles to the east from Africa? Okay. I'll have to look at the map. What? Wow. All right. Okay. 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 All right. Let me let me. Okay, let me go back to, to what I was discussing or trying to. Anyway, so Pro 1000 and the options for refilling. Lucky for us, lucky for us, they have made this. Actually, you can refill it directly, even without having to drill, you know, a fill hole. It's a little bit, you know, you have to practice at it. You need a tip that will fit that port. A port right here. And this is, by the way, what's inside one of those cartridges. There are one, two, three, four parts. No, five parts, including the chip. And there's a little poppet valve six, six parts in there. So there is no venting in here, at least in under this condition. So assuming this was empty. I could say um, this takes 80 ml of ink, so I would get maybe start with something like 60. So I take a huge 100 ml syringe and load um, 60 in it. That way, it gives me 40 ml worth of space in my in my plunger. Uh, so say for instance, this is 60, okay, and this is 100. So I would then load 60, plunger is no air in it. I would stick that in that port, get a nice seal, and I will pull back and create a vacuum. You will see air bubbles coming in through the bottom, and then I would allow that ink to enter. So I am extracting air, creating a negative condition internally, and then just allowing liquid to go in. And you do this back and forth, back and forth until you are done. You All your 60 are gone. Then you load 20 and do the same thing. So you have basically vacuum filled this cartridge without any modification. It's really flawless. It, you know, it takes longer. If I didn't have to do several of them, that would be the way to do, to do this. That would be the way to go. And so you end up with a full cartridge. Nothing has been tampered. All you did was extract air, replace it with liquid, back and forth, back and forth, 
until all of your 80 ml. That's why they provide you. And I think this is it right here. I've used up some of it, but when you buy a load of ink, this is OEM, um, it comes with 82 ml of ink. So you pay for 82, you inject 82 in there. That way you get a full load right off the bat. It has to have been empty. The problem with being empty is that the chip is also empty. So you replace the chip with a new one, okay? One of these right here. So you replace the yellow chip with an, a new yellow chip. He's not going to be selling these anymore. So if you're still, you know, you're not doing uh, the other methods, then I would recommend you buy, buy him out at this point because he's not going to be buying them from China. They're sort of technically illegal, so he doesn't want to get into any kind of issues, uh, especially living and, you know, operating in Canada. So... So anyway, that is one option. You replace the chip. You have to remove this white cap. That cap is keyed. It has keyways on the side that allow you to only insert this cartridge, the Chroma Optimizer cartridge in the Chroma Optimizer slot. So it will not let you make an error and put it in the wrong slot. So that is it. You vacuum fill it, top it off, replace the chip, put it back in. You're done. Well, the chips are $13. Ink will cost you if it's just the, the non-OEM. And I think at this point, he's selling only two OEM inks in the set. And so you're paying less. It used to be four. You're paying less for the complete set. <clears throat> I think the complete, each color at the 82 ml load amount, it's like 12 to $13. So that's for $12, $13, and then another $13, that's about $26 per cartridge instead of $60, okay? So now the other options. So you say, well, wait a minute, $13 per chip, and you're telling me that they may not be available in the future. Let me just go ahead and do what you've been, you know, spewing about all this time about, you know, disabling the chip. Well, you could do that as well. But when you disable the chip, you really cannot rely on emptying the cartridge, although it has been discussed and discovered that even though that chip will no longer be regulating the ink levels visually so you can see them, the Pro 1000 being what it is, the magnificent machine that it is, well, actually, even with a disabled chip, once the cartridge becomes empty and no more ink can flow into the internal compartment corresponding to Chroma Optimizer, it will stop printing because it is expecting, it has a series of sensors internally, each compartment, all 12 of them. They have three sensors. And so the way it operates, I've discussed this over and over and over again, is when you reach the second level sensor, meaning your ink levels in that little compartment dropped a certain amount, that second level now is, is exposed to air. It is triggered. It opens up a valve that's right in front of this and allows ink to flow by via gravity into that compartment. It tops it back up to full. There's another sensor in the very tippy top, and that is then buried under the chroma optimizer or ink and that's triggered, it shuts off the inlet valve. So no more ink or chrome optimizer can flow in and, 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 com and completely overflow that compartment. It's, it's actually vented, so it, it can overflow. If you just have an uncontrolled flow of ink, it'll just overflow and you'll have a mess on your table. So even with the chip disabled, if there is no more ink left in the cartridge, and that second sensor was triggered, it opens up the valve and says, hey, feed me, refill my compartment. And there's nothing to refill the compartment. So then what happens is this, you continue printing. You don't know this is happening yet. You continue printing and then the third sensor, which is below that one, 
gets triggered. And that's the one that stops the printer from working. So technically, although I am not recommending you do this, you could just simply allow the cartridge with the disabled chip to go empty. It will stop the printer from working. You take that cartridge out and then you load it via vacuum or whatever. This method is just as easy, much quicker um, with ink. You put it back in. It's going to then run. You're going to experience a, a so-called uh, agitation cycle, possibly. You know, the whole shebang of, of pre-flight checks that the printer will do. It will then allow ink to refill that internal compartment. And it should then reach the top. The valve is triggered off. It is closed now. No more ink can go in. And you can begin printing again. Uh, no, I'd rather do it the way we've been doing it. Do not allow the, the, the cartridge to ever go empty. So we're using externally mounted sensors. So the trick to using those is, of course, the first thing you need to accomplish is disabling that chip. And here's where people are just, basically, they just don't have enough patience, I guess. I didn't either. If you just simply do the drilling to basically create a refillable container. This is just a container. There's nothing inside. The only technology exists here at the port and this cap. It's a really nifty cap, okay? The rest is just a bottle, nothing inside. So you drill that hole, say when it is about low, you can weigh it. Full is 112, empty is 32. So you can weigh it. And when it's about mid midpoint, let's say you got like, you know, 40 ml of ink left in it, you drill it. By the way, the chip's still working, so you should know. It'll say 50% or halfway down. You take it out, drill it carefully. Don't get chips inside, although they will just simply float. And then uh, put a plug on it after you refill it, put it back in. You want to weigh uh, 112 grams, so you put it back in. The chip is still at 50%. So now you have twice the amount of ink the printer thinks you have. The way that the printer has been telling the chip, hey, you need to now drop a certain amount. Oh, you need to drop a certain amount again. Oh, you need, again, over and over and over. The way it knows that is because every refilling cycle or replenishing cycle that occurs of that internal compartment, I hope you guys get this, it is always the same amount, whatever that amount is. It is always the same amount every single time. So it just basically adds how many times did I refill that compartment. And it also knows how much ink was used in a cleaning cycle. Nothing to do with printing, actual printing. Okay, So even if you suck out enough ink by a you know from a cleaning cycle to drop it to that second sensor same thing whether you were printing or sucking ink out during a cleaning cycle is going to trigger that second valve i call it the refill valve it opens the refill sensor it opens up the valve replenishes the compartment goes back up triggers the upper one and closes the valve so every single cycle that it does that uses the same exact amount of ink. So it can do the math and figure out. So now it's 50% and it drops down to enough ink is being then used to the point where it should be at a low condition. And the low condition by weight, I have weight, weighted these in, it's about 54, 55 grams. So if 32 is empty, then whatever the difference is, that is the amount of ink left. But I have a lot more ink in there. So had I not tampered with the cartridge, it would just do its own thing. And when the cartridge is empty, the chip is empty. Okay. But we are tampering. We are, we are fooling it. We are adding, making sure we always have a lot more ink than the printer thinks we have. Okay. It's doing all of these calculations on the fly, and then finally it says, I've already passed 80 ml through that compartment through so many re, you know, refilling cycles. 
I, I should be empty, but somehow ink still keeps flowing in. What's going on? And again, this is where people make a mistake. At that point, they think they're going to reset that, you know, disable that chip and press the pause button. And nothing happens. Of course not. It, you don't reset it from a low condition. You just let it. Patience. Patience. And then you just continue printing. Be happy. Nothing is happening. It's been low now for two months. The yellow exclamation mark. Just keep topping them off. You may get like several, like half of your cartridges with that exclamation mark. And it seems to just remain there forever. Leave it. Don't try to do something drastic. Just leave it. Keep topping them off. At some point, you're going to be printing and you're going to get an error. And you're going to freak out. You're going to go, oh, my God, what happened? It'll say at 1753. That's when you press the pause button. Five seconds, you will see processing. You will see the words processing moving across the screen. And that'll last about another five seconds. And then once it is done, that chip now is disabled. Okay? That is, that's how it works. So don't, like, prematurely try to disable the chip. Because it's not going to work. It simply is not going to work. Now, if you make the mistake, I guess you can say, of letting the cartridge actually go empty before you do any kind of drilling for refilling. Say you never refilled it, but it just naturally ran empty. Basically, the internal compartment was asking for ink, and the cartridge had none. So it went through the next sensor. No more ink is flowing. Sorry, red X. That cartridge now is empty. Well, don't take out the cartridge and throw it away. Take out the cartridge and drill it and add 80 ml of ink. Plug, put it back in. Your display is going to say something to you. Hey, you want to continue printing, you nut? I just told you, you had no ink, but somehow my internal compartment just got replenished. Do you want to continue printing? You may end up killing your printer. It'll, 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 it'll just, the biggest fear monger in the world. You say yes. Okay. And maybe we'll ask you to do that twice before it actually disables the ink. And the error is 1752. Not 1753. 1753 is when you have always been topping off your cartridges and the, the chip stayed low forever. And then finally it just, you know, says, okay, I give up. 1753. Do whatever you want. And then you press pause. The other way is you actually let it go empty without tampering with the cartridge. Take it out. Don't do anything but take it out, drill it, top it off. Put the plug back on and stick it back in. It will do whatever it needs to do, and then it will tell you what to do. If you if you choose to do so, you may be endangering your print, you know, all kinds of fear-mongering techniques. You just say yes. You know you have ink in your cartridge, and eventually it will be disabled as well. But the easiest way is just to do it the you know when when before it reaches low, top off all your cartridges and have patience. Do not try to um beat the system. In other words, we're already beating the system as it is. Here's an interesting comment. Living abundantly, I want to practice printing some of my 28,000 images, but wanted to print decent size and landscape. So I figure I would start with an EcoTank 8550. Uh, can, can I... I, I think you mean, you mean to say, say, use the 8550 with paper from roll. Can that be done? Yeah, you can, but roll paper is curly, and you may end up with some problems with due to the curling of the paper initial. Uh, you may end up with some head strikes, meaning the initial edges of the leading edge or the trailing edge due to the curling might, might get struck 
So it's better to use just, just use uh, pre-cut paper. I mean, it's not impossible, but it's, it's not as easy as using pre-cut paper. We're going to be doing some printing today, so hang in there. Do not go away. I got to hurry up to this. I got one more hour, literally. Um, no, less than that. So, Steve Excel, that's another thing. See, if I want to upgrade to the to allow me to do more, you know, there's more time and other features, it's like 30 something dollars, and I don't even earn that much. <laughs> a week on, on on this so so that's 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 a bit of an issue okay steve excel living abundantly i think the 8550 can print up to two meters length panorama so you could yeah if you if you could cut the paper perfectly at right angles in other words that front edge ha has to be exactly 90 degrees to the edge and you babysit it as you're feeling you know as, as you are loading it in other words, if you have something that's, you know, like you said, two meters long, you're going to have, you can't just let it sit there and walk away. So you're going to have to initially hold it until the grabbers grab it and then starts fading. And if it sees an error as far as uh, any skewing, it may reject it. And uh, yeah, but you can, you can, you can do it. And uh, uh, Red River sells um, rather long uh, sheets of paper, also pre-cut. Photo Nikon 780 says, drilling the card with ink in it, do you not have to worry about plastic? Okay, so a lot of people ask that. But have you ever thought, I don't have one here, a drill bit, it pulls chips out. It's got a reverse helix. When you're drilling into wood, imagine if the chips were not being drawn out, you would jam up your drill, okay? So, yeah, the chips are actually being pulled out. You have to start with a, a small dry, diameter drill bit, like a sixteenth of an inch, and then move up to the 5.32nds. And just do it with a hand drill very carefully. All the chips come out. They actually get pulled out. Um, unless you're really sloppy. I've done it. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you know, not you guys. I, I've been really sloppy. And... Uh, I'm lucky I have a milling machine and drill presses and everything. I can jig up all my cartridges and drill them perfectly. Uh, but if you're doing with a hand drill, then, you know, you start with a make a pilot hole first and then move up to the 530 seconds diameter. And then what I like to do, because it's such a gummy material, this plastic is, is not, doesn't really drill very well. They actually have uh, drill bits for plastic. They have a more acute angle on the uh, cutting edge and so they can slice through plastics a lot easier um but you know a regular drill bit will work and so you just basically drill very slowly watch where the chips are going they will be pulled out they're not going to be um, sucked in in other words it can't it's a reverse helix and it cannot possibly get into the printer no you have no idea how small the inlet port is and besides they would float once you drill it once you say for instance if you're just uh, using chips you let it run out flush that living daylights out of it with a syringe and you know i've just trust me i haven't had a single issue doing that whatsoever Okay, so people, they want it. I don't know why, but it's it's happened. And they have a pigment printer, and they want to turn it into a dye-based printer. Isn't that kind of backwards? Uh, I've, I've known people that take an Epson dye printer, like a 1400, and loaded it with pigment inks. Somehow they were able to find matching pigment inks. Don't ask me where. But that's that's backwards, taking a pigment ink printer and turning it into a dye ink printer. Really, there's no need to do that nowadays. I, I, I could see, and I just checked Inkjet Mall cone color. They used to have something called thrift inks, like thrifty. In other words, lower cost. Um, they made an ink set 
for the K3 uh, systems, the Ultra Chrome K3 systems. And people were tired of these third party pigment inks having such awful gloss differential on glossy papers. So they decided to turn, say, a 3880 into a dye ink set uh, type printer. Well, those inks are no longer available. They are completely discontinued and gone. I don't know why. I tried them. I used them in the past. It was great. You know, um, my my Epson 28, uh, 2400, they use seven colors, um, unlike the 28. 80, which used the, the nine uh, cartridges. Um, but anyway, they could all be converted to dye ink, and the results were fantastic. They were good. Um, longevity, who knows? I, I really don't know how good those dye inks from even from cone color were. Nobody really bothered to test them. They're gone now, so there's no way that I can recommend going that route. I thought I would be able to, but not, not any longer. I just checked and they are gone discontinued no longer available so why would you want to do that when you have an 8550 an xp 15000 they're fabulous real quickly because again we're running out of time this is the photo that everybody was harping about and telling me that I should not have gotten that. Um, this is printed on the very fancy Red River. Um, what kind of paper is this? Yeah, that San Gabriel paper is Burrita. Let me, let me turn this on a second. Here we go. Now you can see it is neutral. Look at that. This is the 8550, folks. This is out of a 4x5 negative, which was scanned and made available through the National, uh, what is it, Library of Congress website. So this is 8550, folks. I just want to emphasize that, okay? This is the San Gabriel paper. The other one was not, sorry. A similar paper. But look at look at the results that we got here. It's, it's just gorgeous. And the black and white was neutral. So why wouldn't a color image, same settings, also be reproduced? neutral in other words if i if you can that theoretically if you can reproduce say you got an rgb who has been turned into a black and white still maintaining all three channels color channels as opposed to a color image and assuming all of the colors are in gamut they have to be okay in this case so you cannot have like super neon saturated colors just natural colors if I do a gamut check on this, nothing will turn gray. Okay? So if I can print a neutral rendition of this image, which is again, you know, from a 4 by 5 negative and yeah, perfectly scanned, this will match what I see on my monitor. If this image looked neutral on my monitor because the monitor calibrated correctly, then this print when I compare it to the image being displayed on my monitor, should also be a match. If you print on glossy, this is what this puppy is made for. Okay. And I, I don't know whether I printed this with advanced black and white, or not, not advanced black and white, that's only available on the big Epson printers, but black and white mode, and I added a sepia tone. You can see it. You can do a global addition of any kind of tone you want or just outright just neutralize the living daylights out of it so that it is neutral or cool, bluish or brownish. And you can see how, how really awesome that looks. And of course, the contrast is, I, I play with that. Okay, that was me in uh, Photoshop. 
Are you sold yet? Okay, if you're wondering. Empty classroom. Look at the colors. Okay. Gloss differential? Of course, it doesn't exist. It's a dye ink printer. Are you satisfied with every single color I was able to reproduce here? You see what I mean? So the only the only negative aspect of this printer is that it does not have red ink. So it has to it has to composite red ink from magenta and yellow. And it does a very good job. It's just not as good as a printer that has a proprietary red ink like the XP15000. But the XP15000 doesn't have gray, and this printer does. So for your black and whites, for your graduated tonalities, gray is the ink that comes into play. Again, beautiful. You want bright colors? Here you go. XP. 15,000 can do this as well, but we're talking 8550 with high volume tanks that do not require chips. And if you saw me last week, I topped off all of them except for gray. I did that later on, but you saw me. It took seconds to top off each one of those tanks. How about luster paper? So the other one was glossy. This is luster. Okay. Oh, by the way, so shiny papers, papers with delicate surfaces like Verita, like I showed you earlier, that San Gabriel. Do you see any roller marks? And people have been talking about seeing roller marks or other types of artifacts. I don't see any. There's really nothing to see except a beautiful image. Is it upside down? Yeah, it is upside down. Of a carousel going crazy. I wouldn't want to be there. I, I, I suffer from dizzy stuff. I, I cannot do these spinning rides. But that, it's amazing. Slow shutter speed shows the motion of the carousel. Okay. Or whatever the heck that is. panoramas okay not panoramas but say landscapes seascapes look at this folks how in the world could you possibly improve on this and i'm, I'm not showing off this is not even my image someone else's image but this is my print and this is just i think it's some kind of Epson luster paper. Sold yet? I, I think you I think the answer is yes. Anyway. And, and it goes on and on and on. So I have so many prints, but the 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 the, the thing is it is a capable printer. And you should not have any issues or should not even be considering trying to convert. And they were talking about taking an Epson printer that uses pigment inks and then using these inks and then diluting the red, or no, diluting the, the magenta, the cyan with a clear ink uh, that I, the guy said that I formulated. I'm going, really, dude? You're that good? Maybe you should work for a lab instead of uh, these crazy experiments. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. You could just buy an 8550. If you don't want something that large, get the 8500. The, the 85 series uses a six-color palette, and that has matte black ink. So you can then print on matte media, which we will be doing next once we get done here. Rick Johnson, he's the guy that modifies cartridges for you, okay? You can either send them yours or buy already ready-to-be-used sets on eBay. Link in some my, is in my video descriptions. 
have a look at that and uh yeah so the drill bit that i use has was made to kick the shaving out it's labeled a split point bit yeah there's lots of different types of bits but i have never really had a problem with chips going ink it's almost impossible the chips are always being pulled out because of the reverse helix of the drill bit all right so very quickly let me show you some things some issues let me see if that so this has been discussed over and over and over so what do you see you see scuff marks you see head strikes you see all kinds of black you know smudges and that comes from the surface of the printhead nozzle plate how does that happen well the surface of the the nozzle check plate the nozzle uh, plate is touching the paper how does that happen well the paper rose up well how did it rise up it had curls it was a curly paper well how can it be a curly paper paper comes in a flat box no this guy was using roll paper that's that's why i was saying that you have to be careful see the rolls are always rolled with the printable surface on the outside so they're always going to be curling in this direction like that so that's what causes that and after a lot of digging back and forth i say wait a minute are you roll printing are you printing from cut sheets from a roll yeah well, why the heck didn't you say that? Because he did not correlate the connection between printing from, you know, your own self-cut sheets of paper from a roll. Uh, he he didn't really see the connection between that. He didn't even know where the smudges were coming from. Always, always, folks, if you see this on the surfaces of your prints, it's always from the printhead, unless they are like, lines like bands that could be from the rollers being dirty because you may be doing a lot of borderless printing okay so that was one of the problems we i had to you know help someone with let me go ahead and remove this we have one more over here and this is interesting i had really never heard of this But anyway, let me find it again. I gotta scroll way down here. We're getting there, we're getting there. Right here. And this may be a bit difficult to dis discern. So you have a sheet of paper here. He's actually showing us a sheet of paper, and then on top, a printed um, one, the border. And you can see that there's a difference in color. Uh, this is white, and this is kind of a little bit yellowish. And what could possibly do this? He says this, that he prints, takes the finished prints, inserts them into a glassine uh, envelope and then stores them and i'm thinking wait 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 did you and this is a high-end fine art paper and i'm going wait did you let the prints dry 24 hours no he did not so apparently the degassing process that takes place after you finish printing an image, you should let it sit there for a day so that it can completely evaporate any kind of gases that are produced are vented to the atmosphere. They cannot be vented when you insert the print immediately into a glassine envelope. Bingo. He had some yellowing of his base and um, I asked him, can you do that with a non, you know, high-end paper, uh, say a RC paper? And 
see whether you get the same results and put one in a glassine envelope and put one outside to dry overnight. With the RC paper, this did not occur. It was only happening with your high-end, you know, your non-RC or resin-coated papers that are used for, you know, like maybe like my San Gabriel from Red River. So it must be affecting the base color somehow. Weird, but true. One more here. This is really hot news. Let's go ahead and jump into this because we are, we got like 45 minutes left. So I received an email from whom? From Red River. And it said, Red River Paper, Drew's News. This is Drew um, Hendricks, the owner and president. Tips, tricks, and know-how from the owner of Red River. Q&A. What are EMY files and why should I be using them? Any clue, anyone? Do you know what these are? I had no idea what he was talking about. So I read further and basically it's the same as for Canon, the M A M I one X or something like that which are basically media configuration files. But then I thought, wait a minute, Epson printers don't have the software for you to be able to install in the driver specific media configuration files for non-Epson papers, like you can on Canon. So if my Canon uh, Pro 1000 has a ton of Red River media types listed on my media menu they are actually listed and you might ask yourself let me go back to me a second so i can explain what i'm talking about so you may ask yourself well big deal i just i'm printing with a red river luster paper i'm going to choose my canon luster paper choice well wrong because your canon luster paper might be thinner than the red river luster paper your Canon luster paper might require X amount of ink density, total ink density, to create the correct levels, okay, values, where the Red River may need more or less. You see? So simply using, say, Canon Pro Luster with a Red River Polar Luster and even their ICC profile, you may not get the same results because of those differences, those physical differences that have to be addressed. The gap of the printhead has to be perfectly set because maybe that paper is thicker, maybe that paper is thinner, and so on. So that's what that file addresses, okay? That's what it addresses. Let me go back to this. This is better. So let's go back here. If you own a newer Epson Sure Color Printer, and I assume he means the 700 and the 9,000. Join the crowd if you have heard of them and have looked at the available support from Epson. You may still have questions. EMY files are the custom media types to help clarify what they are, how they are used, and how to make them use self. Red River Papers, please to announce the definitive everything you need to know resource for Epson EM, EMY files. Let's click on that. Why not, right? So this is where you go. Now, there is, as you can see here, EMY stands for Epson Media Files. They are a custom media type. What is a media type? If you print, you should set them every time you click the print button in the Windows driver. They are these. So if you look down here, you got your Epson available media types that Epson created for their driver for, I don't know what this printer is, okay? And then Mr. Hendricks installed these Red River Palo Duro semi-gloss rag. 
Well, that has specific setting requirements. And by that, I mean ink density, printhead gas, uh, printhead um, gap settings, quality, maximum quality uh, settings that you cannot exceed. Okay. Some papers do not allow you to use the highest dots, um, uh, so-called uh, dots per inch, not, not pixels per inch, but dots per inch um, quality settings. So it will set that automatically for you. Red River Ultra Pro Gloss, Red River Pecos Gloss, 42 pounds. You see that? These, these papers come into different weights, different thicknesses. So all of them have to be uh, custom fitted, in other words, into the driver. And when you install one of those files, this is what you get on the driver after the fact. In other words, you'll be able to then just choose that particular paper and not just a similar type paper choice, okay? And then on a Mac, it'll be like this. Epson created EMY files to do a few things. Be a media type settings, contain certain advanced settings such as paper thickness, plate and gap, what I just said, ink density, and more. I haven't read this yet, so I was correct describing what the requirements are. So I'm glad. Uh, I have to pat my back. Uh, encompass color management information in very select applications, not in Photoshop, Lightroom, and any other everyday apps you may use. Oh. Uh oh. They also remove the now embedded settings from the driver where they used to be easily accessible. They are good in that EMY is a one stop shop for settings and troublesome. And troublesome if you don't like dealing with a media installer application. Okay, so there is a media installer you can install. You download that file. And if it's anything like the one from Canon, you should be able to simply click on the, the file that you're trying to install. It'll go through the process of installation. And then you, then you launch the driver. And there, there must be some kind of updating procedure. I can show you what that looks like on Canon because I am not going to put you through all of this right here. You can just look that up. I will make that link available. Uh, basically, it is, let me go back. No, I think that's it right there. I am going to go ahead and post it on my Facebook group later on. So let's go back to the driver. I'm going to go back to my Pro 1000 driver because this is going to be basically the same process and you should be able to follow what I'm talking about. Why is this good? It's, I think it's fabulous, not just good because, and I'll show you in one second here when I, once I get my driver all set up here. Okie doke. So here we go. So there's my driver's preferences, printing preferences. And so I have standard. Of course, we're going to be using photo printing. And I have defaults always to borderless. Remove that. And then um, we're going to click on color matching. Select to none. And OK. Apply. And now we're set. We have just set our driver so that it does not control color, okay? It does not control color. The application you print from, you're gonna tell it to control color. With Q image, it's automatic. I, you don't have to do what I just did, okay? But say from Photoshop or Lightroom, then you have to basically just deny color management being done inside the driver. So let's assume that I've already installed some of these AM1X files. They are installed at the driver, at the printer, in the printer itself, not the driver yet. They are installed in my printer. So I have to extract them from my printer into my driver. So you go to maintenance and see right here, it says update media information. Okay. Click on that. And basically you'll see this and you execute it. I've already done that, okay? 
So you execute, it will perform the updating. And once you are done, then you close the driver and basically reopen it. So we'll just do that. Now we got the driver back. Now let's click on our media type. So we have plain paper, photo papers. These are the original ones that were available. I still don't see where are my Red River paper choices. The actual custom paper choices for all my Red River Red River papers. I don't see them. Hagari, that's Japanese stuff. Custom. You need to go to the custom button or the tab and there are all my papers if i just click on any one of those i should be able to get my printer to do the best possible job ever okay so let's go and we're going to use uh i don't think they have one yeah they don't have one for the paper that i currently have so i cannot use this system I was hoping that there would be one for San Gabriel. They they stopped making that paper, so there's no uh, media configuration file available, unfortunately. But say, for instance, you have Paladuro etching, so you're going to click on that. Paper source top feed is not available for this selected media type. Paper source setting has been changed to manual feed. It's a fine art paper. It has to be fed through the manual feeder, which is located where? In the rear of the printer, the back. So now if I try to choose some other paper, feed position is not going to allow me. So let's, let's choose another paper. How about polar luster? And let's see. Hi. We're going to choose 13 by 19. For some reason, it's not letting me uh, use anything but the manual feed. So, again, whatever this locks onto, that's what you're going to have to use. But again, the beauty of this is that it's going to then allow you to be able to use that paper. All of the physical characteristics of the paper will be taken into account when it sets up the printer to print for you. The gap will be correct, okay? It will not be set to some other setting, okay? A thickness or, or gap, gap width, I guess. Yeah, so the gap, in other words, surface of the nozzle plate to paper is a constant. So if the paper is thicker, it's going to be higher. The surface is going to be presented higher. So that would reduce the gap unless you adjusted it. And so that is what it's doing. Say the gap has to be 10 thousandths of an inch. So, well, I have a paper now that's thinner. Well, now the gap is 12 thousandths of an inch. That means your spray can is too far back. It has to be at the optimal distance from the surface you are spraying. In this case, you're spitting out a little droplet of ink, a little circle of ink. So it has to be kept at that optimal setting. That's why you need these media configuration files to set each paper choice automatically to the correct gap. You cannot just use a facsimile. Um, it, it's not going to be perfect. Okay. So where can I get these files from? Well, I wish it was that easy. I wish they were available through, say, every paper manufacturer out there. But it seems that Red River, I guess that's a kudos to Red River, they have actually um, been able to include them. And they're, they are a pain in the rear to produce. It takes a lot of work to produce one of those files. Okay. And to have it tested and to have it declared optimal and then to make it available to you so it requires a lot of work it's like precision colors hundreds of test prints just to come up with a blend that matches oem as well as possible it's a lot of paper 
used a lot of time and effort, a lot of testing and blending and, you know, refilling and making sure that the printhead now has that particular brand of ink. That means you just wasted a lot of ink doing cleaning cycles just to bring that new blend to the print. You see what I mean? So, yeah, huge pain in the you-know-what it is. I got some pictures here that I want to share with you. Hang on one second. That's not it. I talked about last week about the possibility of turning one of those printers into a direct-to-garment or direct-to-film printer, and I thought that would not be really a good idea. All right, here's, here's an issue. Someone, I don't know why they're having this issue. But I will show it to you and share it with you. So this is a uh, Pro 10. Pro 10. Uh, what is that? R2000? Two something. R740, something like that. I don't know what it is. And then the 8550. The person is having problems centering a stack of two photos. And I'm going like, really? Dude, you're doing something wrong. So let's let's go ahead. So he says that, of course, this is one printer. There's another printer. And then the 8550. So you got one driver, one driver, one driver. Except your layout is controlled by your printing application. Okay. Not necessarily your driver. The printing application gets a layout that you design yourself, and then you send it through the driver to be printed. So let's go ahead and open up QImage just for fun. We're going to do a quickie here. But before we do that, before we do that, as always, nozzle check time. Wake up. You notice the screen was black, so it was sleeping. Let's see how long this takes. Let's see how long this takes. Um, when did I print last? Last Sunday. It's when I printed my last print with this printer. So we'll see. Let it, let it go through its prep. Boy, is that thing crooked. I have a lot of paper loaded here. That's why. So after a week sitting there doing nothing, that's perfect. See that? And you can look at, there's some things that you can look at. It's not just, am I missing any of these little lines? You can look at the dimension. This, this is ba basically a very shallow set of steps. One line, the next line, the next line. Each line is one nozzle in that particular channel. You're looking for the straightness of the each one of those steps. Each step is only goes down maybe half an inch if it was a real set of steps, real stairs. So each step has to be horizontal. If it has a kink on it or maybe it changes angle, then there's something in that particular nozzle deflecting that droplet of ink. It doesn't mean that it's going to have detrimental effects on your prints. It just means that it's attempting to produce a perfectly horizontal line. One nozzle produces each one of those lines, and there are how many? I don't want to count them, okay, per channel. So let's go ahead and lay out what that person was trying to lay out, and we'll see if we get an off, you know, result on our on our. 8550 here. We'll open up Q image. Drink me a little bit of coffee. Seems very quiet upstairs. I think my wife went out with my son to pick up something at my wife, uh, my daughter's store. She works at Bloomingdale's. 
Okay, doke. So let's take this over here. I need to reduce this. This is entirely too big. I think this will work. Okay, so I think what he had, and this is uh, some of uh, my my uh, friend's newest images here. We're gonna do that some other day, I think, because I need I need to. Um, I'm worried about my time frame here, so we're just gonna load two of these images now. Basically, what he had was two images, one on top of the other. So let's go ahead and do print and say because this is um eight and a half by 11 i think i can squeeze in two five by sevens and we're going to have auto cropping on uh let's see oh that looks colorful one oh my mom nice mom is there looking good my dad handsome as ever in heaven of course uh, okay, we'll do these. Okay, so we have two equal size images. They have been cropped to fit. Notice the borders, the same on the left, the same on the right. That, that would be, normally this will be the leading edge, the trailing edge. And of course, you would tilt if you have a horizontal image or, or not. We're, we're looking to see if it's going to shove them both to the left. It's not going to. It can't. Look at it. This is what you will get. If your layout looks like this, you will get that. Simple. I I, I don't get it. And I tried to answer him, and I got no reply back. So hopefully he solved the issue. That's all I can say. You know, so we'll let this go ahead and load, and uh, we'll see what we get. It should be... It should be as good as you see on the screen. And so, although this screen absolutely sucks, as good as you, I see it on this screen. So, I don't even have to do, I don't even have to do a comparison because I know it's going to be, oh, look at this. This is cute. Remember I told you guys that I um, topped off all the tanks. Check your ink levels regularly. Yes, sir. I will. Thank you. I hear movement. They must still be here. Almost. I just want you guys to see the color this this puppy can can generate. <laughs> I mean, come on. Plus the fact that, unlike what the other person was experiencing, so I think it's just it's it's user error. So as you can see, it's centered. But not only that, I knew that we're going to be centered. That, that was not an issue. Uh, I, I know, absolutely know that this is a user error. He's got something. I don't know what he's printing out of. Um, if he was using Hue image, this would never happen, what he was experiencing. But look at the color, okay? It's just fabulous. Fantastic. Let's do while we have time. We're going to do on the, on the Pro 1000. I did an also check early. And perfect. Hard to see. I have paper loaded. So what we'll do is we'll take the Q image and I have a setting already saved. So we're going to delete this. Just remove all. I'm going to go back to uh, my buddy's photos here. Where did it go? 
right here newest photos printer I'm going to go ahead and I already have a save so I'm just going to click on that and I'm going to click on my dates to set everything back from top to bottom in chronological order so I'm looking for Pro 1000 Red River San Gabriel right here 11 by 14 so we're just basically going to click on that. I have all the settings are already, already preset. They're 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 saved. Boom. And there it is. You see that? Simple as as simple as apple pie, as I say, or sliced bread. So this one he sent me twice because he needed to straighten the tower of that church. So we can see what that looks like. I don't want to crop it, obviously, because that would be horrific. You don't do that to other people's images. So we'll leave it like that. So this is the intended way that the image is to be printed. One thing I'm going to do is I'm going to simply do my exposure adjustment and add a little bit of uh, sharpening, although I don't think it needs it. Yeah, it's fine. Maybe a tiny bit, but I'll leave it like that. I think that's that is sufficiently sharpened. OK, and OK. And we are done. Let's add one more. Church interior. Again, we'll look at the inside. Editing and add exposure. What this does, it gives me a just above black and just below white. So it's going to adjust that dynamic range if it needs to. If it doesn't need to, it will not do it. Boom. So add a little bit of sharpening. Do we do we need to? Let me see. Yeah, why not? Just output sharpening is always really required when you are printing on a paper such as a matte paper. Not so much on glossy media because the dot gain amount is so minimal that you're not going to have any kind of a spread that could diminish the apparent sharpness of your image. That's it. We'll just do that pair. Maybe we'll do one black and white. How about that? We'll be checking this to see what the capabilities of this puppy are. And this looks pretty sharp to me already, so I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to send this massive set of three images over to the Pro 1000. We'll come back. You guys hit me with some questions or comments while that is printing, and uh, we'll then end the show, if you will, on that note. So this is going to take a bit of time. To load. I hope I don't freeze. So there you go. It's loading. It's going to load and at the same time begin to send the information over to the printer. So the, the 8550 can print on Canon Mat, uh, Pro Mat, which is, I put it away finally. I've been spewing about that. It's available on, on uh, Amazon. Where did I put that box at? For very little. It's like something like $18 for 50 sheets letter size. It's a nice semi-thick paper uh, with a gorgeous coating on it. And I have an ICC profile you guys can use for your 8550 located in my uh, Facebook group. You can download that, install it, and then use QImage to print that. Just apply that. So you're going to use um, presentation mat, I believe, for the paper setting. And then the ICC profile itself. Tell QImage to use the profile. It will automatically then turn off color management in the driver. You'll get the same results I'm getting here. Okay? You cannot beat that. You can't beat that. And... Uh, with this, the same thing, I'm using the ICC profile they originally had for that paper, although the paper now is, is not no longer manufactured. So, 
but at least the ICC profile was still available. So that's awesome. So if you guys have any questions while well, all of this is taking place. Yeah, well, let me just say this. Let's see what the print looks like. It's a little crooked. That's because I have so many sheets uh, loaded, but it is, it is actually. Let me just print that again. Once this is done, we'll go ahead and print it again. It's just the paper. See that it's skewed. And you know where that goes when that happens? Sorry. Sorry, paper. Sorry, print. But yeah, no, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be perfect. Trust me. Let's wait for this to load. I'm gonna go ahead and remove a lot of this stuff. Remember the the way that here we go. See that? Is that that alignment wasn't quite right. So this is still loading up. I cannot delete these photos yet. So we'll wait for that to happen. See on the on the on the layout if you take a, if you have this software you should be able to see that there is an un unprintable margin and this margin is always wider than this margin this margin is thinner than this one but we created a border that was half inch so that exceeds it exceeds the minimal printable margins so whatever you throw at it will be centered okay it will be centered so once this pops as full Wait a minute, we are at 98%. So as, as, as soon as it goes ding dong, we'll delete this whole thing and uh, go back and redo, we'll redo that setup with uh, some of the other images. I don't wanna, I don't wanna use these because these are crapped, crapped, cropped to different dimensions. So it's not going to be the same effect. So let me go ahead and, and remove all. We'll go back to the original settings for the Canon paper that I use. 8550 Canon Photo Matte. Okay. Let's go back to photos for printing. We'll just load another pair of photos here. Let that load up. that one and that one it doesn't matter what it is i just want to line them up and we should be able to get well notice i don't have to check anything the, the settings are already pre pre-saved in other words and so they're going to be perfect that's already printing immediately it started to print because why because i ran an also check just hours ago Seventy-four percent. So I'm going to go ahead and remove all of this paper, so I don't have any kind of issues with skewing or anything like that. I'll hang back here and I'll help it go down. The there we go. The output of this printer is fabulous. However, as you guys saw, it does have its Achilles heel, if you will. And that is the feed mechanism. It's not as, as built like a tank uh, as other printers are, like the Pro 1000, for instance. But we'll see. Yeah, this is going to be perfect. So it, it requires, you cannot just walk away and load 50 sheets of paper. No, that's that's not going to work. You will have issues with maybe a little bit of skewing if you're not careful. See what I mean? If you were to measure here to the edge and here to the edge, it's the same. It's never going to be absolutely equal because positioning is impossible. It cannot be perfect every single time. And that happens even with higher end printers, okay? You have to 
when I print, I do like single prints at a time most of the time. The fact that I loaded three sheets of that fancy paper, it's got me a little bit worried. I, I got to go get the first print. Be back. He has not finished printing the first one yet. So with that particular paper, I had to choose a specific setting in the driver and then save it as part of the, the setup that I saved. And that was called prevent paper abrasion. And the reason that gorgeous paper that I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes, it tends to buckle. The ink density requirements were not really um, done perfectly well, okay? Uh, there is no um, media file that I can load. That would solve the problem. I have to load a, I think it's a semi-gloss paper choice. And that semi-gloss paper choice, it does use a higher density amount of ink. And it's too much ink for the red for the San Gabriel paper. So I have to reduce the amount of density and I have to also apply uh, prevent paper abrasion, which is a slightly wider um, print head to paper gap. So I'm waiting for the next sheet to be loaded. There's three images we're going to be looking at. If you guys have any questions, please go ahead and post right now while we wait. When you, if you ever review or rewatch a live stream, there's going to be ads, at least that are triggered, hopefully they load every 30 minutes. Okay, so it's not going to, you're not going to be bombarded with ads every 30 minutes. Please watch them. If they pop up, don't, don't skip them. Please watch them. That that way we earn a fraction of a penny per view. Okay? Yeah, really. It's that low. So, and that will help me buy more paper. Yes. She's not going to let me use, you know, the household budget money for buying papers. She's going to, um, no, not allowed. So I have to generate that income through this show and through other videos and other, you know, functions like maybe Amazon affiliate link. So if you buy anything from Amazon, use the link that I provided you all on my video descriptions, and that will be credited to the channel and Amazon for any sale that you generate using those links will provide income to the channel. That's how we survive. Okay. Otherwise, I may have to stop doing this. Do you really want that to happen? I don't want to happen. I don't want it to happen. I don't do this for money. I do this for enjoyment I, I really derive an immense amount of pleasure helping people out i'm going to talk about one more subject before we go and this is a little bit touchy precision colors he's going to be moving he's in the process of packing up and moving uh, to a different location business is going to cut be cut back a lot he's going to concentrate on only um a few uh, printers that can be refilled okay you do you figure out which ones you know which ones we're talking about anything uh, older than say 10 years is not going to be supported anymore because he's moving to a cottage and so he's going to be on the outside of the city so things are going to slow down he needs to he needs to so um that way um he can uh, enjoy the rest of his life, whatever is left of it. And, you know, we're all old at this point. I'm 75 almost. And so, you know, my dad passed away at 88. So say I got another 12 years to go. Am I going to be able to do this for the rest of that time? Who knows? So he's going to slow down. He's going to cut back. And uh, he wanted to just outright just sell the business. But that didn't really pan out and uh, he was literally attempting to give it to me and i told him i i can't do it there's no way that i can do it 
it, it would it, I don't have your expertise. I don't have the ability to communicate with lab ink lab technicians. I don't know what I would be asking for. He says, don't worry, I have the formulas already, you know, already down pat. And uh, I still said, no, I know, I'm, I'm sorry. He was trying to get one of his uh, family members to do it, but they turned him down as well. And someone else, someone else that I know here, you're watching right now, you know who you are. So he's going to be moving. I don't know how long that's going to take. Uh, he's still on vacation officially at this point. Um, and so he will continue to sell the top selling products uh, as well as uh, occasionally whatever he has left over in his inventory. Uh, once it is gone, it is gone. The chips, once they are gone, they are gone. That's it. You're going to have to do the procedure that we were always preaching, the disabling of the chips. So I think we're done. Oh, the second one's coming out. Let me get the first one. I want to hold this with 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 um, white cotton gloves. My God, look at this! And I could see the application of Chrome Optimizer reaches the non-printable margins, and that's it. So the so this this is your your leading edge. The non-printable margin ends right here about an eighth of an inch in and then the trailing edge is wider so you see you can't see this but you got to take my word for it the application chrome optimizer stops at the non-printable margin edge and this margin is about 1.5 wider times wider than this one so the non-printable edges do do differ that's this is why people go crazy saying i i feel my printable area, but my image is not center. Of course it's not. This edge is different than this edge. Okay. The non-printable margin is different. Okay. It's a different width. And it's clearly indicated in the layout tool on your image. I don't know about other tools. Now on the this edge and this edge, exactly the same thing again. They're just not equal. Now I could cheat. If I can figure out, get, get this, if I could figure out how much is the expansion of an image if I was to print it borderless. So I have a border on these, half inch here, half inch there. So I could say, make a, I don't know, 5.5 or 0.6 um, inch border. So that'll be a wider border, but then I print it borderless. So it's going to take everything and expand it a little bit more. And I might end up with a close half inch border, but the Chrome Optimizer will now be applied to the very edge. And that would only be required if I'm going to mount this flush, say on Masonite, nicely done with black edges on the Masonite and then flush mounted on the wall on a floating mount. That way, when you get up close and pixel peep, you will see an even application of gloss all the way to the edges instead of the way it is now, which is it stops beyond before the edges. And it's not equal, OK? Because it's, that's the way drivers are. So I could put this on a frame, however, and the frame will cover that that non-printed gloss op, you know, optimizer edge. But other than that, absolutely gorgeous. Wow. The de There's a nest up there. Holy cow. I think that's a nest. If you were here with me, you can see every single brick on that. Okay. So let's get the other one. Okay. This is going to go back here to the rest of the collection. Like so, and get the other one.
and he did provide the um, location and titles. So you remember what that looked like earlier. It's just the beauty of this paper is just magnificent. And of course, if you have images to match that, that level of magnificence, <laughs> then uh, yeah, you hit the jackpot with it. So that that is just crazy, crazy good. And he's being very careful. Look at this. Look at the vertical edges here. They're not tilting. You see that? I often cringe when I see photos and one side is at a different angle than the other side. Okie dokie. Oh, man. Thank you, Rudy. We continue to support you as well. Buy Rudy's holders. Yeah, link is on the descriptions. Everything's there for you guys to, you know, benefit from, basically. Uh, yeah, I will definitely try. Yeah. We have so many videos already on the channel that are all really, they're all basically relevant, especially the technique-oriented uh, uh, videos. Technique hasn't changed at all. There's different approaches as to how to set up, say, a printer driver. Um, but if you go back 15 years ago, it was the same as today. It's just that now we have uh, slightly more automated systems, and especially QImage does everything for you anyway. So you might as well use that. I don't have to ever worry about, how did I print those pictures for my friend? I don't remember how, to, how I did it. Oh, just find the preset and just activate it and reload it, everything will be reset. The paper size, everything. The borders that I happen to have, uh, all of that will be saved, and the, the, especially the profile, paper settings, quality settings, everything is saved. Okay, so I don't think I actually spoke about converting that. It's a crazy idea somebody had. Let me show you. If I did talk about it, I apologize. But anyway, this is what people were trying to do. And I don't understand why. So there is such a thing as direct to garment printing or direct to film printing. Film is now what most people do. All it is is you're going to be transferring an image onto a non-white, say, T-shirt. So the, the way you print white, on a white t-shirt is the same way you print white on a piece of white paper. You just don't, you don't deposit ink. Okay. But what if the, if the t-shirt is blue, what if the paper was blue, you would have to deposit a layer of white first, and then on top of that print your color image. So what you see here in front of you is a cis unit. And you might say, wait a minute, what in the world are you doing that for? when the 8550 already has internal tanks that hold a bottle of ink. One of these puppies, that much. So why would you want to have an external CIS system? Well, if you had a dedicated direct-to-film printer from, say, Brother, um, they have a feature that this will not provide you, and that is internal agitation so the tank the inks in the tanks are constantly kept suspended these inks do not stay put they settle the white ink especially titanium white would settle and clog the living daylights out of your printer and i still think this is crazy but somebody wants to do it and if as you can see it's an external cis unit you can see the ink lines here as well directly leading to the dampers he he re, he removed the uh, lid on his uh on his uh, printhead assembly so here are the tanks he has bypassed that now. okay he's going externally directly to the ink dampers 
in the print head. The print, yeah, they're, they are dampers because this is basically also a, a cis unit. You might say, well, why don't you just direct the ink into the tanks? Well, you can't. And I'll tell you the simple reason. Like I said earlier, these inks settle. They have to be kept constantly agitated. He has to take this system, put the plugs on it, and then shake it every day. What about internal, you might ask? Oh, you don't want to hear that. He has to remove the inks every single day and then recharge the system with this resuspended inks. And I'm thinking, why in the hell do you want to go that route? Simply to be able to print on garments. The way they do it now is they print on film and then they put a, the film goes, you reverse the image on film. It lays down a white base first. If it's not a, a shape like a rectangle, if it's just a, say, uh, a cropped graphic, it'll print that whole graphic first with titanium white. And then on top of that, we'll, again, we'll refeed the paper back through the, the film, back to the printer. It, is, it goes back and forth and they will then add the color. Then you take that and you apply it to your material, T-shirt, whatever it is, with a heat press. I think it's backwards. I think you got to print color first and then white and then flip it over. Oh, my. Yeah, why? You must be selling a lot of T-shirts. I hope so. I would never want to do that to my precious 8550. No way. No way. First of all, you why? Okay. Buy for a couple thousand dollars, you can buy a dedicated printer for that. That is made specifically for that. Oh, this is, you know, five five fifty or whatever. No, I'm sorry. The savings is simply not something I would consider, you know, a motivation for me to go that route. There's no way. Um, yeah, buy the dedicated proven printer that has the internal uh, agitation that will keep that white ink suspended. That white ink is what caused every printed failure in earlier days when people were printing on garments directly. They would have a printer that had a straight feed. Most printers do. I can feed from the front as well. Um, not on this one, but on others. Um, like um, the P800, I can feed a, a whole sheet of uh, 17 by whatever through the front. I could print on poster board up to 1.5 millimeters thickness. So what they had was a very thin board and they would actually stretch a, 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 a t-shirt over it, send it in. It would lay down the first layer of white and then on top of that, the color layer. So, and it has to be perfectly registered. And so, sure, you have to convert your printer to that type of situation. And because of the problem with the titanium white, those printheads wouldn't last. So here's what these crazy people were doing. That thing is done. I'll be done in a minute here. And it's always all, already two hours. So here's what they were doing. And you might find this amusing. I used to. So depending on which Epson printer model was available at that particular time, they've been doing this for years, by the way. Uh, the R2000 became like one of the most popular direct-to-garment printers ever. Here's what they did. They would buy 100 of them. Wow, you have that many printer, print printers? Uh, t-shirts to print no they needed to modify say 10 of them on a big circular system just like they do um, silk screening and that meant that they would have to be physically modified to accept that board onto which the t-shirt would be installed on and so what about the inks well the inks also what about the driver you can't use a driver you're dealing with white inks the first two channels on the left when it comes to that one the two blacks become two whites so you don't have black anymore okay yeah well you do you have yellow magenta black and then two black two white inks and so you need a driver no there's no driver so you need a special rip software rest what is it 
raster image processing. And here's the here's the problem. What about the other 90 units that I bought? Remember, I bought 100 R 2000s. I surgically modified 10 of them. And then I removed the other 90 print heads out of the other 90 printers. And on eBay, all of a sudden, they keep appearing, you know, R2000, no print head, $50. And I'm thinking, what the hell is this all about? I come to find out that the reason they had all of these print heads sitting and waiting was because that titanium white was not being agitated. Sure, they were printing every day on it just mass producing these t-shirts but they could not control the 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 settling of the pigment okay pig uh, titanium white is used for artist paints the oil paints and that sort of thing and also other uses but it's just simply not made for inkjet printing and so it was it was completely destroying these printheads so every couple of months they would have to replace them and they were buying so so was every R2000 being sold out there? Most of them were. Yeah, very difficult to find one at that point. Now, what about the, you might ask yourself, what about the 100, so you bought 100 printers. What about the 100 sets of OEM inks that the printer came with? Oh, those were being sold on eBay for like $15 a set. So you figure eight times the normal price was $20 each. $15 is pretty nice uh, buy. So I bought like 20 sets of those. And I still have the inks. I got to revive that printer because it's really a good printer. It's really a good printer. So that's me. How do you like that story? Yes. So that actually went on. That actually was going on at that time. And... Even today, you can find R2000 ink sets for about $45, which they should be, like I said, $20 times eight. So, mm. wow. I'm looking at it upside down. Isn't that amazing? It almost looks HDR. Gorgeous. Well, a wonderful way to end the day. Once I get all of those images printed, they will go to Herald. They will be signed, printed by me. And uh, that'll be, and I'll add the paper type and all of that, the printer model and so on. And uh, that'll be my, my little, uh, not gift because he did provide me with payment and also, um, a lot of uh, Pro 10 inks and cartridges that were brand new. Uh, yeah, so that, that's a lot of money that I received there uh, just for uh, that favor. And I'm really enjoying doing that. And he seems to be enjoying sending me all of these images pretty much as, as, he, as he is able to edit them. I get them in by, via email. So let me see. Los, Los Jokers. Do you know where I can find HTC profiles for the EcoTank? 18, 1800 and what is it? 18,010? I've never heard of that one. Yeah, they, you know, it depends. Here, here's the catch. If a printer by, and I'm sure you're looking for specific papers, right? HTC profiles for specific papers. If that company, is, oh, I didn't know I had a warm mode. Hmm. Hang on one second. I don't want to set to that. Okay. That's what I want. Okay. If that paper manufacturing company decides 
that the ET 8, 18,100 is not really a, a photo printer, they're not going to spend the time producing ICC profiles for their papers. Simple as that. The EcoTank 8550, again, the same thing. Uh, they just don't treat it as a photo printer, except I think I've proven everybody wrong. Did you see the results I'm, I'm getting on that puppy? I mean, it's, it's crazy. And to answer your question, uh, probably not available because of that very simple reason. They don't think it's a photo printer, so they're not going to spend the time the time and money to generate profiles for it. They're just going to concentrate on the real photo printers from Epson or Canon. So, yeah, it's sad, but that's the truth. So you'd have to make your own, um, just like I'm doing. All right? Now, some companies like Red River, they're a little bit more um, inclusive, and they do have profiles for printers such as those, I believe. Let me check. Let me, before I... Before I pass on information that may not be true, let me see. Red River Paper Come on. Okay. So let's see what they have available here. Now I'm curious. Make sure they got the same. So we're going to type in ICC. And let's see. Right here. Let's look for Epson. Now, is that Ecotank printer... Is that the correct number, 18,100? Because it's not listed here. So the only ones are the 8550, the 8500, 7700, 7750, 2800, 2750, 3750, and so on. So that may be... Okay, so it's not available here. So is it the same as the 8550? If it is, then yeah, they do have, but this is just for those papers, you see, their papers. So again, I'm not I'm not sure what papers you're looking ICC profiles for. And again, it's up to the companies that manufacture these papers to create these profiles so that you can enjoy them with your printer. And quite often they just don't think this is a color printer. Hannah Mule doesn't think it's a color printer. I mean, a photo printer and, you know, the fancy paper companies, they don't think that's a, a photo capable printer. So they simply don't spend the time to provide you with papers, paper profiles. Okay. Rick Johnson is clearing all of this out. So he uses light magenta, light science. So it's going to be uh, um, sort of similar to um, like a, like a 1400 six colors. No, is it six? Yeah, six colors. Yellow, light, magenta, regular magenta, light cyan, regular cyan, and black. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, that's probably the reason they just don't think of it as a photo printer. They didn't think that 1400 as a photo printer either. So, anyway, all righty. So, that. It sounds very quiet upstairs. I think they all left. So let me go ahead and remove this. We're going to be modifying this. Like I said, folks, if you missed my uh, opener, I am not going to be doing a live stream next Sunday. I will be away. My wife is going to be dealing with her aunt's funeral with the uh, her cousin, and that will take place on sun no, Saturday. And I will be in Florida visiting my sister, which I haven't seen for, you know, since my mom passed away 
years ago. So I hope that you guys have a wonderful week. I certainly hope my travels are, um, you know, no issues. And, uh, oh, I got to look forward to a medical procedure next Tuesday, which is a colonoscopy, which I hate. But it's time that I do it again. So you cannot argue with that. So <laughs> not going to be fun, especially since I'm going to be away and you're supposed to, like, diet a certain way without any kind of high fiber, this and that. And that does not exist in my sister's home. She's Puerto Rican like I am. We, we eat high fiber, okay? So I have to tell her that I will not be able to eat uh, at least that stuff uh, Sunday. So then I got to go on my little prep. Yuck. Uh, all right. So <laughs> that's going to take place on Tuesday. So wish me luck. Not this Tuesday, the following Tuesday, the 30th. All right. Thank you so much again. Don't forget to subscribe, share, and like. Let's go ahead and choose. How about if I do my life uh, slideshow? That'll be a fun one to watch. All right. Thank you so much again, you guys. Happy printing, everybody. Bye-bye.